everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jezia Hamoudi. I'm the director of Onassis Onyx. We're so pleased uh, to have you here today for the inaugural event uh, for Art-Based Anthologies, which is Rhizome's new initiative for digital art histories. Um, today, in discussion, we're going to have some great folks who I'm sure you're familiar with. We have artist Aurea Harvey in the studio for the first time. Welcome. Um, in conversation with Michael Connor, the co-executive director of Rhizome, Regina Harsani, the associate curator of media at the Museum of the Moving Image, and streaming in, we have Dragan Espenshid, Rhizome's director of Pre preservation. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Jazia. Um, yes, before we get started, um, I'm Michael Connor, co-executive director of Rhizome. And um, yeah, we're here today to announce um, a new initiative that we've been hatching for some time called Art-Based Anthologies. Um, it really comes out of a prior uh, project that we did called Net Art Anthology, um, which was an effort to offer a history of, of net art or possible definition of net art through 100 exemplary works. So we made this kind of nice website where we had um, each week a new project that we would present that would be newly recontextualized and reperformed. Um, we did a book and a traveling exhibition and events. Um, and it was something that we'll tell our grandkids about, I think. You know, it was like a real um, cross-institutional effort. And I think since that time, we've been wanting to revisit that way of working because Rhizome does a great deal of work, which you'll hear about on digital art conservation, and it can be difficult to tell the stories of that work and also of the underlying work that we're, you know, that we're trying to like recover and, and contextualize. So, um, so we are starting this new initiative where we're going to be presenting on a repertory basis uh, works from broader histories of digital art, an effort to kind of offer a, um, an equitable historical accounting of the field, to offer different positions, um, and not as tightly defined into web-based art, but instead kind of a broader um, understanding. Um, and so our very first edition of this new series is in celebration of the work of Aurea Harvey, who's here with us today. We are so thrilled to have her. Um, this was curated in conjunction with an exhibition at Museum of the Moving Image, which um, there'll be a tour of at three. It's called My Veins Are the Wires, My Body is Your Keyboard. I always mix the my and the your. Um, but it's a great show, and if you haven't seen it, do take advantage of the tour. Um, our online exhibition, curated by Regina, is uh, bringing together four of the early net-based pieces um, from that exhibition, you know, many of which I think have not been really available online for quite some time because of outdated software, you know, f uh, changes that, uh, uh, that software companies have wrought. And so they're represented um, in emulation and in different forms of access on this website. And so today we're going to celebrate this moment by talking about the curation and conservation of these works. And, um, and in, in order to start us off, uh, Dragon is going to kind of offer uh, some of our principles of how we work uh, on, that, on that kind of topic. But I think the general kind of theme is that we're thinking about curation and conservation as things that happen in conjunction, sometimes in a single figure, such as Regina. <laughs> and um, yeah, Dragon, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. OK. Um, now, I want to say before yeah. also, this project was made possible with a grant from Tudor Foundation. So thank you for that visionary help. All right, Dragon, it's yours now. OK. Um, and am I audible to anyone over there? OK, I think I heard a yes. Um, and also, yeah, I prepared, I prepared a few slides and I will give everyone here like a, some kind of a speed run through what um, emulation can do for digital art conservation. Um, I think the, the first thing that is, that is important to understand about this is that uh, digital art has a, has a particular kind of objecthood to itself. So it is never legible without uh, like huge ensembles of technology and whatever, what people might call the stack, the internet, data centers, browsers, you name it. 
Um, but there is also, uh, yeah, it, it can be conceptualized actually relatively simple. There is always required some kind of artifact, like a digital artifact. That is what remains of a digital artwork or actually any kind of software. When you when you turn the computer off, it's like data at rest. It is stored somewhere. And only when you put that data into some kind of environment where it is able to perform, the object actually appears and becomes legible in the first place. Otherwise, it's more or less like garbage book on some uh, on some disk and we can yeah use this this like three steps also for for preservation um here i want to show you some artifacts these are uh, zip files i downloaded from aria's dropbox and i want to also just quickly say um that aria seems to be one of the best organized artists to work with it was uh, yeah, <laughs> really good to get snapshots of different stages of different works in like packaged together as zips. Amazing. All artists should do that. Um, and you see here, this is this is also important. So the original file uh, mod last modified dates have been preserved too, which is also not a given again, very good. Uh, so, but you also see that an artwork is like composed of many of many different files. Here is just like a bunch of HTML files. So HTML seems like not a big deal. You just double click it, and usually your browser runs and it shows you something. So this is um, the Entropy Eight um, website in my regular browser, which is Firefox version nine thousand or something. It's constantly updating itself. And it seems it seems at first glance it looks fine. Um, there's maybe some error messages, but I mean everyone just clicks the X. It might also be commercial banner. You don't really look there. The, the thing is that it, it looks okay, but you don't really know what you're missing, kind of, because the browser doesn't tell you, oh well, I'm not compatible with that file anymore, or this JavaScript doesn't run anymore because that time has long passed, because you're looking at the work that was like started in 1996. Um if I put it into a contemporaneous environment, this is your Windows 98 with a Netscape browser, you see like different things happen. For instance, this control window here appears. Um, and in general, uh, lots of windows appear. I believe that um, today web browsing is something completely different than it was during the time this, this work was made and was really active online. and. Um, yeah, also Aurea, of course, like took the whole screen as a as a space that could be designed and that could be changed and moved around independently. So yeah, you see, that's like that's like a big difference from looking at it in Firefox or Chrome or God forbid Safari. So um I want to now just give like a few points of what emulation can really be good for or what it can be thought of as like as like really useful for. So first of all, emulation has some kind of totality to it. So it is usually emulating hardware. So this is here, this is an emulation of some computer from like 1999 and Windows 98 is installed in it. And an emulator is always made to run any software that was made to run on that kind of hardware. So you don't need to think about like an artwork in its smallest parts. Like, do I need to convert this video to some other format? And do I need to change something over here or over there? It's more like the whole thing is put into that environment and supposedly works if the emulator is done well. Um, that means you can avoid migration if you don't want to do that. Um, if I would want to make the Entropy 8 site with all these pop-up windows and so forth, work today um, and be kind of true to this original version, it would be, yeah, it would be a lot of work and it you would need to make lots and lots of compromises. You have to make compromises with emulation too, more on that later, but they're usually easier to swallow. Um, an emulator also, if an artwork is set up in emulation, it also ser can service documentation of that artwork. If, 
it embodies knowledge about the artwork as it used to behave, even if you later decide to make this artwork in a completely, if you, if you want to present it in a completely different way, you will always have an emulator to look at it as it, as it used to be. Um, emulators are also great to historicize digital art, which is usually a difficult thing to do. And it's great for retrospective exhibitions, for example. Um, and yeah, also, I think it supports stewardship and ownership because you can actually keep an, a snapshot of a software in a certain state and reproduce it. And yeah, that makes some that makes some things relatively easy because in the end you don't have to like deal with the internal details of the artwork so much. You just have to think like, how do I run this emulator so that um, it is accessible, that it looks good, that it brings out the best in this artwork. And of course, this doesn't only work with entropy8.com, but also yeah, here with Whispering Windows or Skin on Skin on Skin, we are, which are like yeah, roughly from the same period. Okay, um, an interesting thing about digital art is also the object boundaries and um, you have seen this zip downloads before, and that is what usually happens. The artists make something and then they hand it over to some other place, like for exhibition or for archiving or for whatever other reasons. But the object boundaries, especially with net art, are usually pretty blurry. So you don't necessarily know uh, where the object actually ends. It, it's not necessarily where only the things that the artist actually laid their hands on. And while you might think, oh yeah, there is like things that are out of my control, like Instagram or uh, I don't know, subscription version of Photoshop that I can't run anymore if the Adobe server goes offline or things like that. Um, actually, early NetArt has, has this like property already uh, in, in the early 90s. So it's, you know, exemplified here with Aurea's bookmarks that are a huge part of Entropy 8. And I think this is also, yeah, an, an amazing role that artists played at the time as like information brokers, not only thinking about themselves, but also about like how they are connected to other things. How can they help other folks maybe to learn about the internet or art or how to make this stuff yourself. And, um, but these are links to completely like different websites, which are all offline, of course now, or like have changed so much that linking to them wouldn't make sense anymore. So in this case, um, yeah, here are some examples because it was then possible to stream this outbound links to stream them from the Internet Archive and the Library of Congress and the UK National Library Web Archive. Um, there is a program running in the background that looks up these outbound links on these web archives and shows them in this emulation environment. And I think this is, um, yeah, this is also great because it gives you an idea uh, in what kind of environment entropy8.com was existing and why it was so special at that time. And there's also here's like some early glitch art link to doesn't even have a domain name. Nice. <laughs> and then um, temporal consistency is yeah, something that is really required with emulation. Um, and also, I guess, any time um, a work of media art is, or like digital art is always created for a target environment. So if you would be an artist today, you would probably target, I don't know, the Chrome browser or Mac OS 10 point or 11 point or whatever they are at right now. Um, and you can't really mix and match different things in a single environment. This is also why the web archive connection we have here is like set to somewhere around 1998 because like clicking through some of those links, it seemed like that was the time when most of them like looked at looked the best or were like um, work their copies available in these archive uh, in the web archives. 
like around this June 1998 point in time. And with the things that are locally available, you also have to think like there is you know, a bunch of different files, maybe MIDI music or Flash or um, QuickTime VR things, and they all need to work together. So it doesn't make sense to like, I don't know, say I'm moving, I'm converting the movie file to a format that browsers can play today or that is available today for, for users to play. Because then like the pop-up window is in the Netscape browser that have you have seen before. Yeah, so you, you need the Netscape browser to make this pop-up windows. You also need the old version of these videos to run in the Netscape browser. <clears throat> okay, now quickly, when this hardware emulation doesn't really work and where its boundaries are kind of. So um, this is uh, Guernica. This is a, a piece that was yeah, possible to show at the Museum of the Moving Image as a local emulator. Like that, that runs on a machine in the museum. Um, it was not possible to make it work online for several reasons. For instance, it needs a numpad keyboard to, you know, especially this version, to launch different animations on this rotating sphere of the Earth. No one has a numkey keyboard anymore. And even if you connect one, it doesn't really reach the online emulator if you press a key. Um, there's a Granica in this form is already uh, like um, a reduced and abstracted version of what it, what it originally was. Uh, and yeah, it, it doesn't work online. I think I know why, but yeah, there was no time to figure that out. And the Godlove Museum was also run in a full Windows XP emulator, but that turned out to be like too slow because the emulator is running on a cloud computer and the visuals are streamed to users when they access the site. And since the Godlove Museum is like updating the whole screen all the time with really lush animation, um, that streaming was like uh, too slow. <laughs> it's not like streaming video where you already know what happens in the next frame because the video is already done. You never know what happens in the next frame when you're streaming software um, that, is, that can be used interactively. And since this was a hundred percent flash and there was like no different files or formats or videos or audio files or whatever, it was possible to use a JavaScript emulator that runs in the browser. It's, it's the Ruffle emulator and it runs on the local computer when you, on your computer, when you access this website, so that there's no streaming required. So it's pretty fast like that. But a, hard, a full hardware emulator that would emulate the complete operating system, yeah. It's very uncomfortable to run it on your local computer because you would need to download the complete Windows XP to your computer, which is like, yeah, also not so great. Okay, I think that's, yeah, that's a little bit a summary of what we do. Thank you so much. And I'll stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you, Dragon. Thanks, Joaquin. Um, that was great. Yeah. So I'm joined here by Regina and Norea. And do you have uh, initial remarks you want to make, or shall I open with a question? Now that we've heard Dragon's spiel, I have questions already ready for you. Oh, wow. I, I would like to thank Dragon for thinking that I'm a very organized artist, because it never felt that way. <laughs> I felt like I just had like drives and drives full of stuff and just dumped it all on you guys. But I think the main reason why it seemed or organized is that I never deleted anything. And maybe that's the big thing to take away for a lot of digital artists is don't delete your files. Just leave them there. If you have a server, just keep everything there. And like, you know, eventually someone will come along and um <laughs> bring it back. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself by saying this. I mentioned this in every tour that it, this couldn't have happened without Array, like keeping all of these files because you could save like the index folder to load the website. But if you don't also save all of the images and the videos that you're calling in the code, like it's not going to work. So Array had everything, it spent all the painstaking time to organize it, and Dragon was able to compile it. So, so grateful. Good work. Porting is a virtue. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Port your files. Now, so I wanted to actually start with um, just thinking about this work. So we actually have um, 
Entropy 8 is running in emulation in the back. You can also view um, four works in different formats on the, uh, the ArtBase Anthologies um, project page. Um, but when I look at this work, it really feels like, st it, you know, there's this project called Screenful that was a blog. They always said that they wanted to make Stadium Rock for a blog. And I feel like this is like Stadium Rock for, for 640 by 480. <laughs> it's like, you know, full on, like turn it up to 11, like Im immersive experience. Um, yeah, and I was curious, like, Regina, you used the word sculptural, I think, in your curatorial text. And uh, that's obviously a big part of Aria's practice. But it, was it also performative? Where do you talk about performance and sculpture as like aspects of what's happening with a with a piece like this and all of its layers and um, immersive kind of qualities? I'll just say with Greg, I use the word maximalist all the time for this too. But yeah, I think maximalist operatic was <laughs> what I was going for because the net was so plain uh, at that time and uh, all through the '90s there were a lot of uh, stripped down, you know, black background, green text, you know things blinking on and off, and I wanted to see um, texture indeed. Um, so, and, and with my sculpture background, I was giving up. Okay, so like the real is that I was giving up a dimension when I decided to make art online. And this was very difficult at first. Th I, like I felt that, um, that I was missing the tactile and I was missing people's bodies encountering work. So I tried to very m hard to get those back. So I did that through this sort of immu uh, illusion of texture and also in acknowledging my, not only my body but the bodies of others through the work. People might not know Luckily. here that you had a BFA in sculpture, yeah. specifically before you created the website. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so, um, but I very consciously decided not to create physical work during a, a large period of time, actually, it was like kind of a principle it w to to take everything online. But that, to me, meant that I had to, in some ways, um, make up for those missing dimensions that I mentioned before, um, because I think they're important. <laughs> so, how what did it mean to be trying to bring that back through um, through digital media? Was what I was largely dealing with in many different ways. So, when you sca say sculptural, you're talking partly about this encounter w of, of the body in space with... Right, with, with windows, <laughs> in a sense. But also, where is your body when you're online? You know, that was kind of an interesting question back then because people were sort of projecting so much um, into the internet in a way that doesn't happen now exa in exactly the same way, and it's hard to describe. But I think emulation does give back a lot of that context of the texture of the windows. You know, if you can think of the desktop as a landscape, people talk about this sometimes. So like the desktop is a landscape and you have these different um, windows or portals or caves or whatever you, you can you can sort of, people would sort of pr project imaginatively into these different spaces in within these windows. Like, and, and we've lost a lot of that yeah. now because, you know, I don't know how many years it's been, still feels recent to me that we have tabbing in browsers. Right, so you lose right. this more sculptural layered aspect. Yes, we're kind of, we're on a plane here, but there is this, this layering, this yeah. texture I just in the pop-up I think a lot of artists windows. were playing with that landscape of the desktop, you know, and, and the arrangement of windows and the sequence with which you go through each screen was like, so this uh, type of, um, Interface design is something that um, is kind of a lost art at this point when everything is templated or you're, you can't link out or something like that. Those links lists were like essential for every, I can't, uh, everyone had their links list. Like, you know, you couldn't have a website without linking to someone else, you know. And that was also part of that landscape, that idea that you were traveling through that network, yeah. Well, also, um, I don't think I was specifically referring to this in a text, but I often talk about um, our use of CRT monitors throughout the show, including what you see in the back here, um, is sculptural as well. Because if we talk about hardware emulation, what we're saying is like you're creating a virtual machine, right? It's called like a VM. But I couldn't just put that virtual machine environment on you know, a flat screen monitor from 2022 and still have that same experience. So um, especially because younger generations now um, don't have CRT monitors in their homes very much, like from even an educational aspect, treating that as a sculptural object was part of this larger idea around conservation and curation of the work. 
I think even towards that illusion that I was talking about, like it's interesting in an exhibition context to have an older monitor, a CRT monitor, because it tells people you're entering into a different context. I think that's great. But speaking from a historical perspective, also that big box had a certain vibe to it that made you feel like, yeah, there's something inside there, you know? So you really, so I think it, it's very cool to like put the uh, archive work on those type of monitors as well. Not necessary, necessary, but I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, I think like even the way a pixel was constructed by a right, CRT right. monitor is very different it. than yeah. the pixels yeah. we see here. Like digital RGB versus this. I mean, it's a little fetishistic, but I think it's it's kind of awesome to like have that level of detail in an exhibition for people to understand better like what artists were creating with, you know, the actual material that we were dealing with. Well, and I, I think that there's the critique that these things can be nostalgic when you bring obsolete obsoleted software and hardware into an exhibition, but um, Dragon's point in the presentation I thought was really um, apt, which is that you know these software cultures and technological cultures of a certain time, like they have an embodied knowledge that they bring into the exhibition. So you know through that CRT monitor, we are able to, you know, I in an embodied way, understand something about the context in which the work was made. And I think. I think that isn't like something one always has to use, and you know certainly the some artists that don't want to want to do that. But it's I, I think in this, in you know because this work was so much pushing against the limitations of a certain moment and pushing hard on them, then I think it becomes especially pertinent. Yeah, I don't think it would make as much sense. I, it, I think that's what also Dragon was getting at. It wouldn't have made as much sense to just reconstruct this work for a modern browser because it was never on a <laughs> modern browser, so it, it's kind of more respectful to the work to uh, treat it as an artifact and show it in, in, in its original context, which is something I might add I wouldn't have dreamed about like back then, because back then I figured it was ephemeral work, despite me never throwing files away. That's more of a consequence of just my personality. <laughs> I think it wasn't like I was thinking archivally. To, in, in to the contrary, I really had accepted um, during this period, um, 90s, early 2000s, that the work was ephemeral and when it was gone, it was gone, like a performance, you know? And, and that didn't bother me, strictly speaking. Um, so uh, it's nice for me to see it as something that can be treated respectfully even in its historical context. I mean, it should be mentioned, though, that we chose July 1998 for this. Um, and, and you, in this process, did reconstruct the July 1998 version where you can access it technically from any web browser. However, um, why the emulation is so necessary, um, seeing it through Ryzen's website or at the exhibition, is because there's aspects of that that won't work in your browser, like QuickTime videos and yeah. just certain animations and images. So it's incomplete, but you can access a version of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, seeing it through, emulate, through the web, it's like, uh, I think it's a real funny, like, um, recursive um, moment. It's like you're in a web browser and then you're in a computer and then you're in another web browser. I kind of love that, um, I don't know, circular <laughs> like logic of that too. Um, yeah. Dragon, can you say a word? I, I've heard you use the performance metaphor quite a lot in conservation work. Can you talk about why that metaphor is useful as a way of approaching this kind of practice? You know, it's useful for Araya to think of the work itself in that way. Um, but how do you consider emulation a kind of performance as well? Um, yeah, because what I try to like really um, rush through in the in the presentation is that computers are always about doing things, and you can ask them to do certain things for you, and sometimes they obey, and um, but sometimes they also might not obey, or you might make things that are really un uh, unpredictable. That that might be the goal of a work, like all of these of these things that you essentially that you don't know what the next frame will show. You can never tell for sure. Um, that is that is just performance. And the actor is is a computer in that case. Um, I, th I think it's a useful metaphor because of that. And it is also interesting to reflect on like what metaphors have been used for this type of art or um, because I mean, it's performance. It's in it's in between maybe like fine art and performance in some way because it can be captured. It can be made into an artifact. That artifact needs the computer to like 
make the object again. But also, yeah, there was this idea, it's pure performance, it's, it's gone when it's gone, or it's like conceptual art, it's, it's the code, and then it can be recreated every time. Uh, the, the computer is such a, such a great surface for accepting any type of metaphor, essentially. <laughs> and if you have a choice, I mean, you, you can choose what metaphor you want to work with, kind of. I also like and, performance. Um, yeah, and, and performance is a useful one in in that case. But I think um, the like there is a literal way in which some of these works also were performance, not just a metaphorical way. I mean, I mean, Entropy Eight at some point became a live stream of you on your webcam. Yeah, um, me working at my computer, which is where I was pretty much always. <laughs> So so I just put a camera on myself and let people watch me. It was during a moment when there were a lot of um, live streaming, live stream cam girls, so to speak. And so I was playing with this idea like of being a cam girl, but like not in the way that people thought of cam girls. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, right. I'm just sitting here working, guys, you know. And then sometimes like because um, I had a background in sculpture, but also I was doing performance art at for a minute when I was like a student. And and so it was sort of to me a funny way of uh, performing online um, by just being. <laughs> so you can see one of those performances on entropy8.com right, if you right, find it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Did you get like weirdos? No, not at all. It was just a different time, guys. Like you guys wouldn't there have were you no wouldn't weirdos. understand. There might have been weirdos, but people were not so anonymous they were everyone was wh what am i trying to say everyone was anonymous but no one was trying to be um use that anonymity to um just randomly take advantage of other people so much it, it, you kind of had to go looking for that kind of stuff usually people who came to my site were looking for art or design or like found me through another it's due to the nature of the network no i mean it's like i'm saying somebody they found my site because somebody linked to me there was no google you know, <laughs> you know? so if somebody linked to me then they're just like oh okay they're she's related to this other design site and they were looking for a certain thing it's context always you know so in that context no i didn't have never funny enough i made a lot of friends though who yeah. emailed me after they saw me sitting there and like you know so Sometimes became collaborators. Exactly. Who sometimes became collaborators. So the network worked. You know, it just was a different time. There were also no ads. So you know, go figure. But I think that the, you know, the behavior of users and the and the network as a resource in the work, um, those things are not emulatable. Right. And um, I think something we talk about also that Dragon's spoken about in relation to this type of work is that digital culture um, can be thought of as a form of embodied knowledge. And that's maybe counterintuitive because it, you know it's saved in files. It happens on the computer, but actually, you know, within this field, entire art movements can kind of rise up and be s hugely important in a community, and then disappear with almost no trace or without any way of understanding what was going on, except for the knowledge that's sort of like in the bodies of users. And you know what we just heard about like the social dimension of the web ring, acting as this kind of filter for the sort of interaction you would have through a webcam. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's, uh, I think, extremely difficult to um, to think about. And it, it becomes relevant because, you know, th the reason for doing this is to think intentionally about the technology culture that we're trying to create in the present. And, um, yeah, I think let's bring back web rings is my point. <laughs> I'm so for that. There are people working on that yes, in crazy. media arts, <laughs> by the way. I can think of, like, so, yeah. Yeah, but I think that you know we shouldn't fight against that idea of digital culture as embodied knowledge. I think that's actually a positive aspect of it. And it's also maybe another way of thinking about the reasons why this field has been poorly historicized and often ignored by institutions um, in the ways that folk music and cooking might be ignored. It's, it's folk craft <laughs> of the web design uh, of the early 90s, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but there were a lot of artists online at that time. I think, um, you know, I forget what the stat was. Eight um, percent. Eight percent. So apparently, yeah. in 1996, <laughs> um, eight percent of websites, period, were created by artists. Yeah. Yeah. So because that was the context you were in, it was kind of, you know, the 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 mood, the vibe was just very different. So you can't recreate that exactly, I think, but we'll see what happens. Um, so we were talking a bit about the social environments of the web, and we're showing skin on skin on skin here. 
And so there is a uh, story, a backstory of this work, and um, and this is the work really that launched the collaboration of Entropy with Super as well. Um, and I think we've been kind of like, what, you want me to do the next slide? To breathe maybe, because that's the first one in the series. Did we keep that in there? Yeah, it's in there, I think. That so one, yeah. Well, it's weird to talk about this in person, in public, but oh. <laughs> no, 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 because this is how I met my husband. Still in 2024. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, so this notion of collaboration, I think, um, and what that could mean, I suppose, but I'm being euphemistic, <laughs> I guess. I just, yeah, I mean, this was how I started my collaboration with my husband, and, um, and but it was a, col um, what do you call it, a communication, a diary, um, where we passed uh, uh, files back and forth to each other, creating a sequence, uh, a story, a journal of our relationship, I suppose, which got found <laughs> by some other artists, and we released it as a pay-per-view website in 1999 because we wanted people to n to care, I suppose you might say. That's the blunt way of putting it um, because people were just sort of surfing and we were like, you can't just surf past this. Um, and we figured it was a movie. Um, so uh, we charged to get in, which was kind of, I guess, the first time an artist really charged for a web work. Um, it was. Well, it was I the mean first, like, paper. First. I hate saying yeah. first of anything, but, you know. Yeah, first or First, so First hard. we know Tricky of, business. Yeah, always willing to be challenged on that, like someone doing the hard research, like yeah, a PhD exactly. 10 years from now. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and so the, but the money wasn't the point. The point was to, well, to make two points, actually, to, to make a point about caring about what you were looking at. So people were going to be way more attentive if you like, asked them for some money. That was just facts, but also caring about those people and getting their, collecting their thoughts, which are still available in the, in the um, online version of this, like um, the, the exit and interview we did with people who left the site, like what did they think and stuff like that. Um, but also to make a, a, a point about um, sort of the collaboration that we, I don't know, the fact that artists were making work online at all, you know, sort of trying to draw attention to that, even then, you know. Um, and yeah, and it was successful in those points. Um, but I can give some other context yeah. around this. Um, so um, Michael and Araya met specifically on a gr in a group called Hell.com, which we didn't include in this conversation. I'll bring it up now. We also emulated um, a portion of the Hell.com environment. And why that's so special is because Hell.com was a private community where um, back in the day, if you tried to go to that website, you'd have a pop-up window that just basically told you to get out. <laughs> um, but It was uh, so frustrating. If your IP address was like valid, if the founder thought you were a cool artist, he would let you have access to server space and you could collaborate with other artists that are part of hell.com. Yeah. So Araya and Michael meet during um, this webcam hell.com meetup, although Michael's not even on webcam in it. He's like, what was it, fruit or something? Yeah, flowers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, but in hours, within hours of having this conversation really for the first time during this meetup between the two of them, Michael sends this work that you see here, Breathe. This is the beginning of Skin on Skin on Skin. And this is so special to me from a curatorial perspective because to decide to express your love in HTML and JavaScript and Shockwave, you see all these getting used throughout Skin on Skin on Skin, it does a few things. Like for one, it shows the skill set of both Ray and Michael in a sense they're like one-upping each other, just showing each other their skills at this time, which was relatively uncommon, but also expressing intimacy and, and love through that. Like, most people write letters. You're sending, like... No, it's funny you should say that, because it was kind of like trying to, like, what can I do that's going to impress this person? <laughs> trying to impress each other with our JavaScript skills. And, like, you know, but he, he quickly showed me that he had, like, you know, he had, like, real weaponry there. And I was just like, wow. No, it literally, I kind of fell in love with his, like, uh, j JavaScript libraries that he was using. <laughs> I was just like, I want to know how he did that, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but, I mean, that was part of the, yeah, again, the vibe of the time was sharing information, you know, to take it away from me personally. Like, um, sh the sharing of information was, like, a very big part of what the web was. You know, I always thought that, like, a lot of these files, that they would be able to be, bring be brought back. But I always imagined that if there was an exhibition of them, it would be to show that just the code, because... If you ever 
can read the source of any of these files, which you still can, by the way, wink, wink. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there in the comments. There's a lot of things in the way we named, like our functions or our variables. You know, that's a kind of code poetry, to, for lack of a better word. And I always imagined that it would be like, you know, because times sometimes we would say this wouldn't, you know, in a comment at the top, this was put online in honor of, you know, whatever date or something, you know, for a reason, and then we would go on and there would be a certain way that we would write things in there, either for each other or like I would write it just because I wanted to remember that moment that I made that page or whatever. Anyway, just saying. No, I mean, <laughs> this is so relevant and so, it shows just how important emulation as a specific tactic for interventive conservation for this work is. Like if we had migrated it to a different uh, programming language, a different mm -hmm. environment, we lose all of those details and we lose our own kind of intimacy as viewers experiencing this work, a work we should have never experienced to begin with because yeah. it was private. Yeah, <laughs> but that's kind of the awesome part. You never know what's gonna happen <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I think like view source used to be like a really primary function of the it web was. browser. It yeah. was. It was very. It was right on top. It was right, right top level stuff. Business. Everybody reviewed everybody's source code and copied it and tried to understand. If you didn't understand it, you emailed them and said, "How does? How did you manage to like do this thing?" And usually, people would just tell you because who cares, you know? Um, people wanted to see more interesting things. I mean, um, so yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this will take too long to this actually is load. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, always, um, it's always brave to do the emulator startup. Oh, there, there we go. Starting. There's Windows 98. <laughs> the ironic part is I was a Mac person, so like I made all my stuff on Mac and Mac I made all Dragon, do you want to make like a comment or two about why we didn't do Mac emulation? Because uh, Macs crashed all yeah, the time. Yeah, like that's actually like, let's. That's the real. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was one yes, of the harder yeah, there decisions. are two reasons. Yeah. <laughs> there are two reasons. Um, yeah, of course, Mac, Macs are much more crash prone at the time. And, and I think at the time people didn't mind. Um, but yeah, especially with uh, Sh Shockwave is not, is not really running great in a certain type of emulator. And also um, Mac OS, the earlier versions had a little bit of a quirky implementation of the internet protocol like TCP IP that you need to translate so that it can talk to like the web archives of today or things like that. And um, so that, that turned out to be like for the, for the exhibition, it would have turned into a, a huge project to, uh, to make that work locally. Um, but I hope that we will have skin on skin on skin on a Mac in an emulator, like yeah, one there time was or another. One time. So that's gonna make noise, like a lot of noise. You're just obsessed, yeah. I was looking for the source code. Oh, <laughs> I didn't see all these secrets. I, wa well, I want to see the secrets in the it's source. A, it's a frame set, so you know, you're going to have to like do this in your own time, I think. Yeah. You can do this Beyond at the museum, too. Yeah, you can. <laughs> you can. Yeah, and you reconstructed the booth. Where so the this work made the jump to the art world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you want to call it that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's true. That's true. I mean, we did show it in a, in a gallery at one point. Um, that's a long story, though. Like yeah, I don't know if that's, no, that's maybe, maybe yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's maybe during the tour yeah. we'll talk about. Yeah, it yeah. For if those you come coming. to the tour, okay, you're gonna yeah. get the whole um, story. But the last thing I want to say about Mac emulation, because you use, I was even looking into like the specific models of Macs you were yeah. using. Uh, at one point, I was like, let's gut a Mac and just like have it win have Windows underneath it. <laughs> but we didn't do that. <laughs> they were really expensive computers, so to gut them would be like throwing away thousand dollars. How are we doing on time here? Should we, I mean, we we're s we started kind of bringing in the exhibition. Do you want to say a few words about your approach to curating the show and how it got started and um, and why this work is a crucial component of it that every art critic should be sure to take note of? You mean Whispering Windows specifically? Oh, no. <laughs> I meant this body of work. Yeah. But, or, but you can, yeah, or but if you want to speak to this work in particular, that's also why did you want to do this, Richard? <laughs> why would you want to do this? There's so many reasons. I had actually in some form been thinking about Araya's work for like, it, it had to be like close to a decade. I, I remember one of the first times I s 
saw your work was, it was Endless Forest um, at the Whitney. And how they showed it was a video that was projected floor to ceiling. It looked beautiful, but it was a video. And I knew that it was a game. I had downloaded it and played it myself before. And even at that time, you know, I was probably just a college student or something. I was like, if I were to show this, I would show it as playable. So that inter I knew, like, the inter idea of having this exhibition be highly interactive and giving that uh, from a, like, um, you know, didactic perspective, a tactile didactic is this didacticism. Like, I wanted to feel like you were connected to, ex I didn't just kind of imagine, it w and this is maybe too much context, but I know the Whitney in 2000, and 2000 or 2001, that their biennial that year, they asked you yeah. to show, and, and the w they, they didn't understand at the time, it was a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, that you needed that, that that was part of the work. So I, I had felt like very personally motivated to show this in the light that it needs to be shown, and also to kind of <laughs> show other institutions that they can be showing uh, artwork in this way, where I just, um, I, I too often see those just like projections or a tiny screen or like not considering the entire sculptural media specificity of this work historically. Um, and it's a huge undertaking. I mean, this could not have been done without Dragon. This could not have been done without Rhizome. But I think that undertaking and the labor that goes into that is, is worth it because that is how the work is meant in my opinion, for this meant to be shown. It's like the story that I want to tell through your objects. Um, and so, yeah, we went through the, the labor. I mean, so uh, Rhizome did at least, well, we have four works on the website now, but a few more than that. But then I think I personally had to code and like download about 22 pieces for the show. This is to say that I don't expect all media art curators to do that, but that it ha it's worth it, you know? Like, um, the, the proof is out there, I guess. Like, there's now an example. Not that there hadn't been examples in the past. Um, but, yeah, that it, was, it was important, like, show and tell moment in general. And your work and your history and, uh, you know, uh, how ahead of time you constantly are and you're always challenging yourself was, uh, there's, there's, there was no one else that could have better articulated that. I think I think it's uh, it's certainly the first time I see such a comprehensive attempt to uh, revive uh, an entire era of work. <laughs> I don't know how to put it, but um, let me say as a caveat to that that um, not only in my show but in the um, Harold Cohen show that's up at the Whitney, which I hope everyone has seen. It's, it's a beautiful show. Um, and my reaction to that was, wow, what would my life have been in the '90s if I had known this work work existed? And there was no way I could have known it existed. There was no internet when I was in school and like um, when I was going to university here in New York City. And um, um, But I, I mean, it's not that things didn't exist about it, but it's just that it wasn't accepted, so to speak. But so what I'm trying to say now is that while all this stuff exists online, it's really cool and like it's all in its own like, um, you know, attempts to get back at context and all that stuff. I think there's a lot more documentation that needs to happen about this era of work, um, this era of online history, shall we say, also, not only the websites, but maybe um, thinking about games and uh, other types of interactive uh, works. I, I think somebody here even said earlier, there's like entire communities that existed, blew up, and then disappeared, you know? And, then, and you know, even when um, Dragon had the slide of like things that I linked to, and I was looking at that and I was like, oh yeah, that, you know? And it's like, and it's really just bringing back like this notion, this idea in my mind of like, yeah, you know, that was actually really amazing, this particular thing, you know, and and that artist who is just lost to the sands of time right now, like, because they went under a pseudonym and um, and nobody knew who they were anyway, in a way, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, um, but the, at the time they were, extremely influential to others, you know, <laughs> it's like, and so you can't prove that now, you know, necessarily. It, it so yeah, it, so it, I don't know if, Mike, we want to go to the um, Guernica slide, because it's a great example oh of this. Oh yeah, great example. Um, yeah. Where I feel like we don't see a lot of these histories covered in an exhibition context, because again, the labor, it's difficult to revive some of these software environments, and so we're like losing out on so much of this history. And 
I give Guernica as an example because, you know, in the 90s, uh, a lot of media curators would know who Radical Software Group was, RSG, who made this program called Carnivore. I mean, it even showed at the New Museum in an exhibition in the early and 2000s. there were many, many artists involved in that project yeah. that showed, I mean, this, sh this toured, you know, through different institutions that have not long since forgot their commitment in the 90s to, in the early 2000s to new media art. Um, but at the time, I mean, I guess this happens often with many different things in the art world. I'm not like saying that we should be treated special just because we use computers or something. But I am saying that this stuff is way more fragile and delicate. Um, and also it, it goes in and out of cycles of fashion. And it does the art world a great disservice that they forget that, this, that certain types of work are made and in essence, to not be uh, melodramatic about it, but are dooming uh, generations of young artists to reinventing stuff all the time without thinking that there's no progenitors to their, you know, their practice or, um, and, and it's like everything starts again and, 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 and it's just really sad to watch. Like, and I've watched it happen a few cycles already and, um, and I know it happened to me. You know, I didn't know anything about the artists who were using computers in the yeah, 60s and 70s. Yeah, I think you're, you, know, it's you like can't blame almost some of these younger generations for continuing to reinvent the wheel. Like, I we need to put in the labor to make sure that these are visible. Right, right, it's, it's visible. Yeah, and I think I would uh, add that it's not necessarily that the work is even fragile and delicate, but <coughs> the process of making it obsolete is actually a, a it's like, a, it's an artificially produced process. Um, and Dragon, can you talk about why you use the word um, things being obsoleted rather than obsolete? Oh, so glad you asked. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I think there is, um, the, I, I recently started saying that, that software is obsoleted instead of obsolete because this is, yeah, this is a process that is in the interest of, of, the, of the industry, essentially. Um, I mean, I know that, for instance, many um, Tale of Tales titles, for instance, have been kicked out of app stores, for instance, because they were not updated, although there was no need for an update. I mean, it's it's a work of art. It's perfect as it is. Um, it could just be distributed, but it's made artificially, like, obsolete, so it's obsoleted. And that's kind of where, um, where like, the, the preservation and, and conservation of that type of art and of software in general, perhaps, is really a is really a kind of resistance to that to that obsolescence processes, um, which is also making things obsolete is very profitable, and and working against that is not very profitable, which is also something. Yeah, maybe one of the reasons why some institutions, after supporting that type of work for some time, back off later. Yeah, I think it, this kind of memory practice is not only needed by younger artists, but it's also, a, I think, a political practice that is um, very potent and very difficult. <laughs> and that's, you know, I think why these moments of you know celebrating a project like this are so important. Um, and I feel like it might be time to segue to a Q and A and then to refreshments. But I, I want to say th my thank yous while people are thinking of their question um, because. You know, thank you, of course, to Onyx Studio, to Matthew and John and Jazia. Um, but um, a lot of the work for the Art Based Anthologies project, you heard from Dragon, who did um, conservation for Rhizome, and Regina was the curator. But um, Kayla Drozvicki, who's here, did a lot of the kind of um, coordination on our side as well. And um, Mark Beasley um, developed the website with Laura Coons as designer. And so I wanted to say thanks to them. And thanks to all of you for coming. Now, who has a question for me? For them, actually, not for me. For me to relate to them. Uh, you know, to video games and mm -hmm. the discussion Dragon brought in of like uh, outside objects and the boundary. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you've thought about ideal scenarios for the kind of the the emulation of continued engagement. If that engagement is no longer kind of live in the moment, um, you know, it presents another layer of sort of outside performance that mm -hmm. can't always be be part of the technical yeah. emulation. 
you mean the community that surrounds yeah. the project? Like, I mean, you know, if we don't want to, if you don't want to record it as right, a right, video, no, no. you well don't want to show it as a video. The but fun you want part is the community records it as video. <laughs> I can't even count <laughs> the number of endless forest videos that exist on something like YouTube that have been because the game has been online since 2005, and so there's like videos that are older than some of the players. And it has its seasons also, and in that I mean that people grow up and they stop playing and then they remember it and then their kid plays it. Like, you know, it's that's pretty much where we're at at this point with that. So I, I as a something that lives, my, my goal as an artist is to keep it alive, actually. This is actually so. a good place to talk about Guernica versus Eden Dock Garden, which we have an right. image of as well, pl versus Endless Forest, because, and also to talk about artist intent, right? So for Guernica, uh, Araya and Michael were okay with the idea of emulating an environment that could no longer um, be networked. Like the way that it works is that uh, it was accessing d data, it was packet sniffing, right? It doesn't do that anymore, but the decision was made to still show that in the exhibition. For Eden Dot Garden, um, similarly, you can no longer pull HTML tags um, if you type in a URL, which would generate these objects that were had something to do with Quake. I, I don't want to go into the whole thing, but um, and it would generate in your browser um, a Garden of Eden. And the decision was um, that we didn't want to make this kind of like false simulated environment of what that experience would have been like. Um, so, uh, you know, for Endless Forest, it might be a whole other conversation because you can't just say, say we didn't have access to Array and Michael. You can't say like, oh, Guernica, they were okay with that. So it must be okay for Endless Forest because it's not always okay. Um, well, it's not okay for me that Eden Dot Garden can't be resurrected or brought back or somehow recreate. I mean, you would have to remake it. But yeah, I still think it was like one of the best things we ever made. It was amazing. Anyway, but uh, second best thing we ever made. No, Endless Forest being the greatest thing we ever made, honestly. No, the best thing you could do for the Endless Forest is keep it running. Like to me, that's that's all you got to do, you know? And then people come and go through it as they always have. And that those people will change their views of what, okay, this is what links us back to sculpture again. You know, you put a sculpture in a park, the world changes around it, the sculpture stands there, uh, meaning something different to every generation that passes by it. Some people ignore it, then all of a sudden they pay attention to it again. You know, this is what a live artwork can be. You know, and it's definitely what something like The Endless Forest, which is a multiplayer game, can be. Um, many, I would point out also that many multiplayer games are still online, like early, if you look at the history of video games, multiplayer games stay online for decades, like for real. So you can still play like early Ultima Online or something probably, and there'd be pe pe people in it. You but know? I have a, a follow-up question that too, is yeah. like you originally made this in a program called Quest 3D, but you have a beta coming out. They still make right. updates to this all the time. Is we it now in Unity or is it still Quest no, 3D? No, it's in an Unreal now. Oh, it's Unreal um, now. But that is, is it, we're considering that a, a fork in a sense. Uh -huh. um, so OG Endless Forest will always go until it, it breaks, which is why we started uh, creating a new version. But the new version will take on a life of its own. In a way, this is because of the community who loves the first version and thinks the second version is just, what are you doing, you know, changing things? And, <laughs> and so we're like, okay, well, maybe that one stays and we create something else that goes in a different direction. So the um, last thing I'll maybe. say on that is, you know, as long as a server in some format exists, yeah. you can continue to migrate it into an environment right. that's going to allow it to be playable with actual players. Right. So my desire is that that server is something that can be institutionally like supported, such that it can continue to live even though Michael and I are not there, because that was why we created it. How long has that? Yeah, been oh. Go ahead, Dragon. Go Dragon. Go Dragon. Oh. Um. Yeah, um, I, I also wanted to say um, in, in December of 2022, um, Rhizome restaged a uh, cyber powwow at the, at the new museum. And, and I also think that is a good approach. It doesn't need to be like available all the time and it doesn't need necessarily to be like standing there and waiting for someone to, to come by. That is... Um, what, what was happening there was like there was a, a, a particular event created around that work and people were interacting with each other and in uh, like with the artwork 
Yes, it was also and a multi-user environment, which is the crucial. Yeah, yes, and um, and so there uh, there's also the possibility to like create such environments where where these interactions happen again, like on a, on a particular time, especially for things that are not popular or that are like so left field, no, not not like um, Ultima Online, which had a gigantic user base and has, and of course, uh, yeah, some people in there are maybe skilled enough to make their own World of Warcraft servers or their own Ultima Online servers. But for some art projects, that's like much harder to come by. Yeah, and I think, I think yeah, also, so, so that's that's also a way a way of doing it. <clears throat> I mean, Cyber Palo. And I mean, a... I'm glad. I'm super. I'm super glad if Endless Forest just keeps going. Of course. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's Dragon. Amazing. This is such an important point, especially for those in the audience that work at institutions and are thinking about doing these kind of practices. That it's expensive. So, like, this is an important solution. That it's not online all the time. Like, um, because there's a cost to hosting this work. Yeah, I, um, I was going to delve more into Cyber Power, but I think, how long has Endless Forest been actually online? Oh, like I said, so since 2005. Or since yeah. 2005, like so. Constantly running. At first it was hosted by a museum in Luxembourg called Mudam, and then they realized they were still hosting it like 10 years later and got mad at us and told us and kicked us out. Stop paying. So then we've been um, paying for the server ourselves for I don't know how long um, with um, the support of the players. Um, and yeah, so, but for me, a conservation strategy would be someone who keeps the, the server online even when we're not there. Um, that would be the ideal for me, and I'm sure it's the ideal for my Or partner. a consortium of institutions. Or a consortium yeah. of institutions, network together, whatever, yeah. yeah. Any other questions from the floor? Maybe one more. Thank you for this uh, amazing um, conversation. And I've been to an uh, uh, exhibition opening tour in the museum, so I saw all this. Um, so my question is uh, how uh, you decided to uh, deal with uh, net art, and are you planning to expand it to different and to other mediums like XR, for example, it could be a OMX now. <coughs> and um, is there any, I'm an XR uh, practitioner, um, uh, do you see any specifics or differences in XR uh, comparing to what you do? Like, will it stop you uh, doing what expanding to different or, or you like you want to always uh, only uh, uh, deal with net art you know this kind of broad question well I think in the context of art based anthologies we definitely hope to like explore a range of different practices to historicize and I think that immersive media in general uh, is you know more complex area for conservation in a few different ways. But Dragon, do you want to say anything about this, the current state of affairs regarding the conservation side? Um, I know that there's- well, I wasn't able to understand oh, the question, uh, everything, yeah. but is it was it about immersive media? Like XR, v VR, VR. It was about XR, expanding virtual reality uh, stuff. beyond uh, net-based art conservation as rhizomes. Oh, um, yeah, so uh, when, when you just, when you just look at um, like this immersive art from the perspective that it's software and that it's network software like net art kind of the, the strategies theoretically could work. It's just like the, um, the amount of things. I mean, I, I was attending a few workshops and the Tate Modern has a preserving immersive media um, knowledge base and a research group, which I would yeah, recommend everyone to look inside. But when you just when you are presenting such an artwork, you usually have to log in to like ten different online services for I don't know your Facebook account, uh, your um, Unity, your Unity plugin, and the plugin for the plugin, and your RGB 
keyboard that you can that you need to control with an app or whatever. And so then um, there's a lot of like yeah subscription services, a lot of copy protection and really good encryption going on. And until that's um, fixed, like someone uh, yeah gets work workarounds for doing that, uh, it's yeah the migration is the only way of doing it like migrating to the next version of the unity engine or don't do that don't use unity anymore yeah Thank you. I would, um, I would, unreal i would actually <laughs> say that this is something that artists need to think about like is how their work is going to exist beyond them um if you're using this stuff like just don't be a slave to like the yeah. new the, the to jump on a bag wagon for the latest whatever the heck is going on like think about it a little bit think about this stuff as your material is it archival how are you going to make sure that somebody can log into your oculus account they can't that oculus account isn't even going to exist in five years so what are you working on what are you spending years of your life doing but the problem like, is that if oculus if any of these corporations like flash is such a great example yeah. go like oh we're uh obsoleting this thing as you say like then still people will try to create systems like ruffle and they'll try to cease and desist them even though you know it doesn't exist because like we would like to um reverse engineer these programs like we technically have the capabilities to do that but we don't have access to all the source code because it's proprietary and you know um I've had some crazy conversations with companies about like, um, you know, in escrow will, uh, in 10 years, you'll let us have access to the source code of your corporation. You know, there's, there's those kind of strategies, but um, it's incredibly complex when corporations get in the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when Dragon started at Rhizome, I've always been a fan of, of Flash, big Flash guy. Um, and Dragon said something like, my only, my greatest wish as a preservation director would be that Flash would just disappear, <laughs> or not disappear like the work would go away, but that it had never existed. You know, like because it was such a nightmare to pre present this work, and I think it's actually um, you know amazing how many problems have been solved in pre presenting Flash-based artwork in various ways. Some of which you see in this presentation. So I don't know, will something analogous happen with immersive media? I think the level of complexity there is like considerably higher because also of peripherals that get involved, but you know, one can like hope that there are more ways yeah, of breaking. You have to think like what are community produced um, tools right now? Like on what level can a community that works outside of the industry, sometimes yeah, like industry people moonlighting as community members, um, what can they achieve and you see like for all the, um, all the computer systems from the 80s and 90s that were essentially also designed on a kitchen table in most cases. Um, you get um, a, lot, um, a lot of um, emulators, you get a lot of tweaks and stuff. You get things like Scum VM that can play Lucasfilm games or so that were in incredibly popular where the user base was so gigantic that there had to be enough people in there that have the the free time and the capability to create an, like a system mm -hmm. for that, and with you, you see that you see that really drop off. Um, you see that community activity really drop off, or like um, there is not not a way that people can work with this, even if they would have the source code. So it's like emulators that um, we are using to run Windows XP and so forth. That's like th these are emulators produced by the industry because the industry needs them. Uh, to to test drive their next Windows 12 or whatever, so um, they make the poison and they make the remedy and yeah. the and we're always uh, the scavengers the in a sense. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, exactly. Yeah, it's it's very scavengery. Uh, so Flash is also something that that can be like done by a community or even like yeah, the, one of the creators of the emulation as a service thing actually in in his younger days, implemented an open source version of Flash as a browser plugin, as, as a single person. So, so these things are, this, it, it works until a certain level. But yeah, I would, I mean, I usually don't want to tell artists what they should do, and I think they should do whatever they want. And um, no one, especially no preservation person, should tell them, oh, you need to only use Linux or something. But um, <laughs> yeah, 
I would tell them. Uh, there, I, I would tell them. There's, de- there's definitely I a think, risk. I think it's important that artists hear the word that like that. It's important that you think about this a little bit harder. Like um, some people don't think about it at all, and they're just like, oh yeah, I'm using this AI model or whatever. Yeah, well, like, no, no it's like, and you're just right, like, yeah. It's well, not well, about yeah. telling them they have well, I mean to. It's, it's, it's about giving them the education so that they can make the decisions for themselves and hope that they go for the Linux. But sometimes <laughs> I like when artists <laughs> use systems that are like that give me a headache because yeah, it's a fun challenge. And it's also, like, (laughs) it's important for artists to use, like, the bad corporate shit sometimes. Like, they should be using that stuff also. So the thing is that I I also have another answer to your question, which is that in the past, it's never stopped us when, like, a work is not available at all to, like, tell stories about it and present it in certain ways. And, in fact, with Nut Art Anthology, part of the exhibition that we did was about, like, absences and gaps in the archive and, like, the things you cannot see and the kind of reflection on that. And so I think... Um, that's actually something nice about like the history of Rhizome is that the archive that was founded um, in 99 at Rhizome called the Art Base, um, right at the beginning, based on interviews that happened with artists, the um, Mark Tribe decided that there should be um, what he called cloned objects and linked objects so that you could have work in the Art Base that was just like an external link to something else. So there's work in the archive that is not properly conserved and that's okay and that work can be presented or talked about or, or you know, included in some way, even if it's not properly. Like we're not going to wait for the conservation to necessarily be fully there to tell stories about that work. But hopefully that can be used to get funding so that you can go through that process. Yeah, like it would be fun to do like an exhibition of like six incredibly influential works of immersive media that you cannot at all see. And no, and that's cool. I mean, that's something that Rhizome can do that like, I think is really interesting because you've always had this initiative to archive the culture. Um, and, and yeah, I don't mean to say that all artists should l- use Linux at all. It's just more like a consciousness about what you're creating and what you're creating with. And I say that as your, aunt- your art auntie, your net, net art <laughs> auntie or whatever. <laughs> like brainwashed her. <laughs> yeah, well, it's no, it's not just that. It's, it's like, you know, experience. Like the reason why Eden.Garden doesn't work and can't be brought back is because we were using a highly proprietary lockdown, like, plug-in and, you know, extremely exotic. Like, and we knew we were doing it. You know what I mean? We knew we were using something that was going to die. Um, we didn't know how hard it was going to die. <laughs> but, like, you know, it's like y- if you go into it with your eyes open when you're creating with, you know, a product by Meta, knowing that you're going to lose it, you know. But just so you understand how far we went okay. before we decided not to fully conserve this, is, like, um, they still had the CD-ROM with, it was called Pulse 3D, and it was disk imaged and uploaded to Dragon, so yeah, he could review it, it all yeah, we kept before it, we were like, okay, like there's so many more steps to actually get yeah. this online. All right, I think we should wrap up there. Everyone should have a snack, go see the exhibition tour, enjoy this beautiful New York City weather, and let's have a big round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Array especially. Thanks, Dragon. Good to see you.